I feel that the beads come with their own little history tied up, but through the imagination I feel I'm releasing the memories and the histories from the individual beads and I work them up so they have a new story to tell, a new tale to tell and then somebody else buys them and wears them and gives them yet another memory and yet another angle and I just, I love that, it, it's that sort of cyclical thing, that, that the very human thing of, of life moving on and yet with reference to the past and uh, that was the hook that got me into the whole business of beads really. Some of your pieces have a very distinctive sort of nature feature about them. For instance, your frogs and your fishes. Tell me about sort of the one necklace. Absolutely. Uh, the, the pond is outside is a very important element in my life. And uh, that particular necklace, I found that wonderful hornfish across the bottom. And I thought, oh, this is a lovely starting point for a necklace. And gradually other components came together. Uh, the little carved frog, bone frog from Bali, and it, it began to feel like um, the life on the pond. And then I bound it uh, with the sort of aqua colours, the sort of watery colours in the bone and the recycled glass from Africa, those lovely sort of pale bluey green beads. Uh, and that's how that necklace was born. But it was very much a product of my cup of coffee out in the morning, sitting by the pond and w just watching it all happen. And, and dragonflies, again, I mean, they feature quite prominently in your work in earrings and things yeah. like that. They're very vibrant colours. Oh, we have, we have an amazing variety and range of dragonflies visit our pond. But I just love their colours and the way they shimmer. And they make great earrings because they sort of uh, dangle and hover uh, when you're wearing them, just like the dragonflies on the pond. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the piece that you're working on at the moment. Yes, I had a trip out to Cricklade, to the north meadow of Cricklade, which is famous for its snake's head fritillaries. It's an ancient water meadow, and I was stunned. The, the meadow was purple with these flowers, dotted with little yellow celandines, and it was just magical. So I thought, oh, there must be a necklace in this somewhere. I tried various ways. I, I drew the shape, and I tried to replicate the petals, but that didn't sort of do the trick, really. And then I hit upon a way of doing it, and, and that was good, and I was able to make the actual fritillaries. And eventually I came up with a sort of lacy collar that I, I've got now, in with the little leaves and the little snakehead buds and things like that. And uh, it's gradually come together, and I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It sits nicely on the neck. Also, your, your work depicts art. Yeah, well, yes, it, it, that was an interesting new development again. It was a new direction that I, I went in, taking um, Vermeer, whose work I absolutely love, and tr tried to translate the textures and colours of the picture into beads. And one of my favourite pieces is The Milkmaid. And I was in uh, Art in Action one year and came across the, the lovely little porcelain, miniature porcelain jug, and it was just so much like the jug and the milkmaid. I couldn't believe it. So I've got to have this. And it started me off. And there's um, a walnut in there, Chinese walnut, that is carved with a hundred faces that gives this amazing texture. You imagine the labour. And it's just like the bread in the picture sitting in the basket. I want you to just pick up the bowl and just show us, because you're one of those people who will find something, like the little jug. You come across it and think, that's the inspiration Absolutely. for something. I mean, for instance, what do you think that is? I have no idea. And I had no idea what it was, and I found it on a stall of antique tools, wood planes and things like that. It's a plumber's bead, and in the days when they had lead pipes, they had wooden beads like this of all different sizes to pull through to straighten out the kinks in the uh, lead. Just look at the patination yes. at, on that. Uh, that is exquisite. And um, then from the very big to the very tiny, just shows this little bag. Uh, my husband and I were on holiday in the Scilly Isles and about a mile off this cove on St Agnes uh, in the 17th century a Russian ship had gone down with a cargo of Venetian trade beads and they wash up still to this day yeah, and my husband and I spent a whole day <laughs> bottoms in the air combing through because they're sand coloured I mean an impossible task combing through the sand and we got four but they have a history. They, they and also they'll have a history for you when you make something because your memory will yeah. be back on St Agnes. They it? might just be some of the things I never, I keep for myself. Yes. In 
westernised today. They are very throwaway, frivolous adornment but they go right back to the beginning of mankind. Beads were worn by Homo sapiens 40,000 years ago and you can't find a culture anywhere in the world that hasn't used beads in some form. And they are used to mark human moments, from birth to burial, um, passage to the afterlife, love, you name an area of human existence, beads have played a part in it.